All right, it's officially, it's January 30th, 2023, and I want to talk about biodegradable container gardening versus aquaponics. And the reason why is um, I think a lot of people are finally starting to become privy that there's a food shortage that is happening right now in the world. 50% of the world's population is going to experience a huge food shortage. Now, before I go into aquaponics and, and uh, versus container gardening, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about this stuff. Why? And I'll make it brief. Uh, we have... I hate this stuff too. When people, when people, I don't think a lot of people are, are aware of kind of what's going on right now, right? There's a food shortage. Everybody freak out. Okay, some of the people, what they're saying is the United States is going to be not, it'll be fine, right? We're not going to starve to death like certain other countries, but what we're going to experience is shortages of everything and everything shortage, and not just in food and other products too, but sticking to food, it's like you're not going to have eggs for a while, right? You're not going to have this for a while. And the reason why is that Russia p provides 40% of the nitrogen to the world. Um, and the reason why I want to bring this home is that we have the capabilities of producing our own food in our own homes and when we look at this at a macro, right, this, the micro is you have control. You can do a lot of stuff, even if you don't own land. And I ain't got time to go into That's called spin farming. You can look it up yourself. I, mean, I already have done some shows. But what I've noticed, what I've learned from this whole thing is that we've uh, globalized everything. And if a lot of people don't understand what globalization means is that the whole market is open to everybody in the world. So a lot of countries stop producing certain things and they rely on other countries, such as Russia, for, uh, uh, for nitrogen. Never thinking that, wow, what if there was an argument or a fight and that gets, or for any reason, a natural catastrophe that gets cut off, how do I feed my people? How do I feed myself? Now that we can't, we're reliant on each other for all these things. So this is ridiculous and this is why I want to live a resilient, sustainable life because I don't trust these systems that be, right? This could happen in America too, it could happen anywhere. There could be lots of different things and it has happened in the past if you look it up. So that's it, that's, that's the soapbox on that. What I want to talk about is, well, what can we do about it being a solution-based uh, mindset that I have? And one of the things I look at is I want to talk about the aquaponics and the biodegradable container gardening or container gardening in, in general. Uh, I've invented the biodegradable container gardening because I don't have a lot of time. Um, if you, those of you guys, I've talked about it before on my show. It's basically some uh, galvanized wire baskets lined with burlap or old sheets filled with soil. And they're about five gallons a piece. And I'm able to stick these things. I can hang them up on these racks that I've invented uh, to keep them off the ground so that squirrels or rabbits and uh, slugs, snails, you know, mice, all these things can't get to it while I can't attend to it because I'm busy at work. Well, this thing, as I started developing this new gardening system for myself, I realized that it has more implications than just what it was. It's gone. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, in contrast to something like aquaponics, right? And aquaponics, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's basically just getting a vat, filling it up with water, putting some fish in it, some aquatic animals. You circulate the water out of that fish tank where they're pooping and peeing, causing ammonia. And it goes into uh, a, another vat with a floating vessel, say some styrofoam or some PVC pipes. The water is basically just flowing and it's, it's getting in contact with the roots of these vegetables. It could be uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, anything. You'd have a whole entire garden and the plants clean the water and as the water gets circulated back to the fish, they get clean water. But as the fish produce more waste, the waste comes to the plants, which they need. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Well, the thing is, is where it's very aquaponics versus container gardening. It, there's a few things. There's, there's a lot of, uh, of complications that go into aquaponics, which I think a lot of people don't realize when you get into it. I've, I've built these things not anywhere near a commercial, uh, but I am a certified aquaponics builder. <coughs> I've gone through the schooling and all that kind of stuff, but I noticed some different differentiations of things that we can stack functions and get a lot more out of our buck, especially for the long game. And the very first thing is the soil tractor um, method, I guess, what I don't even know how to call it. This is the thing that I've built, right? So when I elevate my, my container gardening, and mind you guys, you don't have to do biodegradable container gardening. I mentioned container. You can use any container. You can get a five gallon bucket, drill some holes in the bottom, fill it up with soil, and you're set to go, right? But getting back to the system that I do, an elevated garden, or even something on the ground, right? It means what's happening is in the elevated sector of, of sections of what I'm doing, there's drippings of, of worm castings and compost tea basically just falling on the ground, right? So what I've done is I've taken these racks and these pallets and these things that I've elevated the garden on, and I've set them over this whole entire area. 
Uh, pallets are about four feet wide, right? My hanging system is about two, two and a half feet wide. So these are perfect areas on top of the ground when we cover it with wood mulch. As the drippings come down, they wet the mulch. And what happens after that is that the mulch is slowly starting to decompose and it's shading the ground from the sun, creating what? Soil. And then with all the worm droppings from the years, all any kind of soil that spills or the foliage when I'm cutting my plants, right? When I'm pruning them, I just chop and drop the permaculture way, put them down in the ground. And as I step and smush them into the ground, like the natural way that ruminants do to, to land, <coughs> we, uh, we get this system where we're actually rebuilding soil, right? So I call it a soil tractor. Let's just say if we left the system in... An area for about four to five years what it's doing as we're growing and eating food we're producing soil so that once we move the system now we can plant directly in the ground if we so choose to now just to finish up on this my systems can also be set the basket or your bucket on the ground on the wood chips and what's going to happen with this is i found is the roots are actually going to penetrate down through the wood chips and into the ground what you do is you lift your five gallon bucket or your container up you snip the roots leave the roots you never turn the soil <coughs> and what's going to happen is that you're, uh, <clears throat> excuse me with my throat. And what's going to happen is that, well, let me wet this thing. This is, uh, sorry about that. Let's take a quick little break. I'm all fired up on this one. So what's happening is we're building soil basically, right? You, you uh, snip the roots and stuff. You leave that in there. In contrast to aquaponics now, let's look. You set a big system on top of the soil. You're blocking out the sunlight. There's many, many pounds. You're smashing the dirt down. You're probably most likely compacting that area in contrast to what I'm doing with the biodegradable container gardening. And you're not really creating anything, right? You're growing food uh, in that section. Once you remove that section, you're going to have to amend that soil up after a couple of years, right? And whatever, whenever you move it. So I like the idea that you're giving the gift to your future self by, by doing these things now and developing that soil and it's not so toxic, which we're going to get into. All right, let's get in, back into my notes here. Um, so uh, the, there's a lot of complications with, with uh, uh, aquaponics. Uh, my systems, the most advanced part is a battery-operated water timer. It takes two AA batteries, a couple little clicks. I actually done some videos on the biodegradable container gardening. Um, I've got a YouTube channel. Uh, I've also got a TikTok. Check it out. Biodegradable container gardening. And um, I, sh I just actually filmed a video this morning on how, to, how simple it is to operate. That's it. It's water pressure. Now, unless the water lines get broken and you have a pause of water, which has happened to me once or twice, um, then, okay, we're, we, our operations are, are, are at standstill, right? But nothing's really going to die. We can literally let these things sit here for a good probably two, three, four days, even in the dead of, of, of summer, tarp these things off. And if the water's out for four days, we're going to have some more serious problems than worry about our food. So, but let's look at the contrast now. Well, let's tarp everything off so the sun doesn't come in, right? And, and, and uh, get direct sunlight off your, your container gardening. So to reduce the amount of evaporation, give it some shade of some sort. Now we look in contrast to um, aquaponics. Aquaponics has a lot of moving parts, right? Uh, you have a water pump, right? We have a battery-operated water timer. You have a water pump, and these things will just go out on their own. They get tired as this little impeller, so as it's pushing water through, you know, I've found that the cheap ones from like Home Depot and stuff, they'll last maybe tops like every two years or so. You'll have to replace them. That's all the fish debris, any sand or anything gets in these things. It starts to mess up this little tiny propeller, which is only probably the size of a quarter, right? Or maybe, well, I think they're a little bit bigger. They're probably about the size of, about twice the size of a silver dollar. Some are down to about a quarter, depending on how big you get one. But this is sucking the water out of the fish tank and into the plants. If this system uh, stops, we're not completely screwed here, uh, but the system does, you're going to have to figure something out, right? Uh, sooner or later here. Um, it's not a huge, huge deal, but in contrast to having to replace a timer than a water pump, uh, the water timer far out, it's, it's way, way easier. So your fish won't die, but the problem you do have, I'm going to have to skip my notes up here, is your oxygen levels, your DO. One of the things that I've learned in an aquaponic system is that the most crucial thing that you would need. What is the most important thing that you would need? Uh, two, you would need a, a water uh, um, a sampler 
it's, it's a, a, a pH balance, right? Ammonia, nitrate, nitrites, and all those kind of things. You need that to know because your fish will die if, if the chemicals go off and your plants will cease to, to move, to, to grow. But the biggest one is the oxygen. And DO means dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen means when we have a bubbler, which is on electric power grid, right? Uh, which I forgot to mention too, that, that water pump, that's on electric grid. Think about how many times you guys have lost electricity in contrast to the loss of water, right? Unless you have a generator or something going on, you know, you're screwed, right? Uh, but the, the uh, oxygen, it's like those little bubblers you use in a fish tank, if you guys have seen, a little stone. So when the bubbles come up through the water, it mixes in with the water, believe it or not, kind of like emulsifies, if you know what that concept is. It, it basically melds together. So we have dis the oxygen dissolves into the water. You don't just have oxygen, right? As it bubbles up, it's got to keep feeding and moving things around so that it, it chemically binds with the water. So if that goes out, your fish are definitely without oxygen. You can imagine, let's just stuff like 20 people inside of a bathroom all standing back to back. And then next thing we know, that water or, or the oxygen level starts to deplete out of it. We start sweating. It starts heating up. We're going to die, right? Very, relatively quickly. So the oxygen is a very, very important uh, matter to, to think about in aquaponics. You know, your next one is going to be, I said, your, your uh, uh, levels, your water levels. It's kind of like a, a jacuzzi or a pool uh, system where you need to measure, where you drop a little colors in to find out where everything's at, right? So I talked about ammonia. Ammonia is what, like, the fish pee and from their poop, it just sits there and ferments and becomes dirty. Um, off the, the uh, a little side shoot here, a tip, is when you got tilapia and stuff like that, they're very susceptible to these problems, whereas you get something like goldfish, they're like, kind of like hogs, right? Uh, they'll last for a long time and they're, you can put them in water, I mean, for weeks and dirty water with no filtration and they'll, they'll relatively be just fine, most of them. So some fish are stronger than others, but they do, you need to measure these ammonia levels and that means you need to add more plants if you've, cause you've got no filtration system, right? You're not getting this little filter. You're relying on the plants to do this job for you. So you'll know in your uh, system, uh, which brought to my mind just now is you always have to have something growing in an aquaponic system. So if you have living things like fish, unless you get some kind of high power filtration system, very high powered, especially if it's at scale, large scale, you always have to have plants and you have to have enough of them. Otherwise that ammonia levels will grow, will get too high and it'll actually ruin everything. So the next one is pH. I think a lot of us know that anywhere from, I think it's what, 6.5 to 7.2, that's the perfect pH where it unlocks uh, the nutrient values for the plants. Uh, magnesium, copper, uh, sulfur, uh, all these different things that the, the plants need that gets locked up if the water gets too acidic or too uh, uh, alkaline is what the pH means. You want it down that center so that everything grows nice and perfect. And this also will set the, the vibe and the, and the environment for the fish to live as well. So there's many things you could do with pH. I don't really have time to go in. I just kind of want to, I'm not knocking aquaponics so much as just Look at the look at the complications that are in these you know in this system as we go through. So you have nitrates, nitrites. These are a lot of uh, things that can mess up and even kill, cause lacerations and things on your fish. So I think another point I want to tell you guys these these four things by the way pH, ammonia, nitrates, and nitrites are are the four biggest ones you're going to have to keep an eye on, and you have to literally go out there. If you're starting your system, really, like you've got to attend this at least every every other day, at least. If you have a small scale, like a small uh, tote, right? They have those IBC totes. They're I think they're like 275 gallons, and you got to it's a, you maybe a, a four by eight foot bed. What'll happen in these small systems is that any changes happen very very rapid. It's just bam, right? That oxygen level. Be why? Because of the water surface. If you or water quantity, maybe we can say. So if you're in a system and you've got 275 gallons of water with fish in them, and then let's just say you have another 275 gallons of water in the, the plant system, you know, that brings you up to what, 550 gallons of water. And it, it's, again, we're, let's think about it like a bathroom. So if we put 20 people inside of that bathroom, it's going to, the oxygen level is going to go off very, you know, deplete very quickly. Whereas if we put 20 people inside of a garage and close the doors and taped everything off, there's a lot more playroom, right? You get the picture. So the larger the system, not only do these nitrates and nitrites and these problems, these infection things that could happen, happen uh, very subtly, you can catch them 
as they start to lift and they just slowly go up and they slowly go back down. Uh, tip though I'd like to say on aquaponics is that the uh, larger the, the volume of water, the more thermal inertia that you get of, of temperature, right? There's people growing stuff in, in Maui where it's not supposed to grow. You're not supposed to be able to grow lettuce in, in, in those types of heat, right? But because the cardiovascular system of these plants, it's kind of like when you're cold, they say, and you can stick somebody's feet in hot water and have them sit there, you heat up the feet, it actually causes the blood flow, the, the inner temperature of your body to regulate back to normal heat. This is what's happening, but in the reverse, we're actually cooling stuff down. All right, I got to stay on topic here with these and not try to veer off too far. So yeah, the general electric shutoff, I think, is where you, if you're not home or you're gone for the day, I don't think that you'd lose your entire system if you were gone at work and you came home and noticed while well, the power is off, but it is definitely a main concern. And we are having, besides food shortage, we're having an energy crisis. The cost of energy of electricity, at least here in Sunnyside, California, it's going up tremendously, guys. So um, some of the things I look at is the cost of fish food versus compost. So if we look at the inputs, right, of an aquaponic system, it has to continually flow. The one thing you could do if everything went out, right, the electric power we were talking about, you can get a generator and just run a, a bubbler. Keep the dissolved oxygen levels going. Without anything else going on, you're good for probably a good week, I would say, four, you know, maybe even two weeks. You're, you're okay, right? But the cost, let's look at the cost of fish food. Somewhere you got to feed those fish. And we have to look at where's that, that uh, fish food coming. And now in this food shortage thing, Who's to say there's not a shortage of food, fish food, basically chicken food, quail food, hay for horses and stuff, right? If we're all in trouble here, this could be something that could very damper, well, damper your food supply system, your personal uh, food supply very, very quickly. Now, you're, you're reliant upon getting this feed. Now, are there things that you can do? Yes, there are such things as black soldier fly, but from what I, it depends what kind of fish you have. Some fish prefer floating food. And be careful with the YouTube videos you hear, right? Just throw them in there. They'll sink to the bottom. Most likely your tilapia are not going to eat those uh, black soldier fly. <coughs> Sorry with the coughing, guys. It just keeps coming back this morning. Uh, they relatively like floating food. Uh, black soldier fly is basically making worms, you know, little... You can do maggots and things like that, but why would you stick those things inside your food system with your, in your water? You could have much complications. Uh, as aquatic uh, plants and stuff you can grow, but again, on large scale, and you still need circulation with electricity. So in, in contrast to biodegradable container gardening or just container gardening in general, you don't really need much other than compost, and these are things that you can develop yourself. Now, one of the things I kind of want to do, a, a, I'm, I'm looking into is a Zola. Uh, I think it's called the Zola, uh, duckweed and things like that. If you can do these at scale to create your own compost, because we do need carbon, we do need greens. And we talk a lot about fringe living, where uh, the significance of geographic location of where you live. If you live in a city, there's tons of lawn clip, uh, clippings. There's tons of leaves, dried leaves that are falling in the fall. That's tons of carbon right there. There's newspaper for carbon. There's all kinds of things that you can use. Free wood chips, right? So a lot of things that you can get to create your own compost, um, going to restaurants and getting their, their food scraps, going to your neighbors and getting food scraps, uh, going to grocery stores. There's some grocery stores, guys, where there's just the bin in the back that's just completely full. I would definitely recommend asking permission first so you don't get in trouble, but just tell them you want to pick all the stuff out for gardening, explain what you're doing. And there's bananas, papayas, rotten food, and their lettuces and stuff that doesn't sell. Take that stuff home and make yourself some compost. Um, so I do think, though, that unless we are building our own compost uh, and we're reliant upon such things as worm castings and stuff, which I, I am right now as well. I'm not 100 percent building uh, nowhere near building my own compost, but it's relatively simple and I'm ready to start because I'm quite getting, you know, I'm getting freaked out with this whole system here. And it's I don't trust a lot of things going on in the food supply. Um, but, yeah, this in contrast to raising my own fish food and stuff like that. I know that I can do compost and the problem is, is doing it at large enough scale, right? So, but I think in your city, you know, in your, in your area where you're at orchards and, you know, another good one is uh, farmer's markets, get the address to the farm where they produce the stuff to sell at the market 
and ask them, I've seen it before, a friend of mine, where they just throw a pile of zucchinis and stuff out. So they, there's just so much, they don't want to deal with it. They're so busy growing food, they're not into really doing the compost. So you can gather a lot of scraps that way, and it's all free. and just takes a little bit of elbow grease. So I think that's the way for us to really get through all this. Uh, when we look at the contrast of food, you know, uh, animal feed, producing our own animal grains and stuff like that, in contrast to let's just produce some compost. Moving forward, portability. So if you do not own your home, or even if you do, right, if you do and you've got a, a, an aquaponics system, that's a lot of work to tear that thing down and move it around on your property. Unless this thing's going 24-7 and you're completely happy with it and you never have to move it, it's not a big issue. If you are going to build it, you make sure that you've got it. You've got gravel on. If you're building it over dirt, there's gravel underneath wherever supports are, bricks or things like that, so the thing doesn't sag right? Because that's a lot of weight. And in time, once it sags, it means you got to drain everything all out. And here's the problem. Aquaponics is like wine. You're going to see a tan color. That is the natural bacteria that's in the atmosphere. It gets better and better. You will notice once you plant your, your first crops in there, they're going to be yellow leaves and things like that. It's not quite as, it hasn't matured yet. So if you had to drain all of that water out, now you got to start from scratch again. And that, that means you got to get rid of your fish, you got you, all that beneficial bacteria. It all, almost reminds me of taking like kombucha or fermented foods for the natural flora in your gut, right? That's what's happening in the aquaponic system is where it's got its flora and everything balanced out and it just starts getting richer. Everybody kind of establishes themselves, okay, this is a home and it's not being disturbed and things start to happen in there just like it does in the soil. So that's one thing when you're going to move this you know, it's not very, it's, it's not as portable as say container gardening, uh, container gardening. Now let's just say, you know, this whole solar tractor thing, it's been five years. I've got these wood chips that are this one foot of wood chips that are actually down to like an inch. And because I've been planting my, the drippings of my, my containers going into that soil, there's worms as I have found on, on my spin farm site, we've already developed in the past two years, probably a good six inches of topsoil on top of hard decomposed granite. All right, that's starting to happen. So literally just pick up your, your drip irrigation and your disconnect your drip irrigation from your buckets or your, your containers. Pick up your, your container and just move it. Just move it over to the next area where you want. Throw them in the back of a van, which I've done and I've got a video on it. Bam, taken off. Reset my stuff in a different location and we're done. And we hook up your, your irrigation and we're continuing to go. Sounds like I'm really bashing aquaponics, but um, guys, it, it's just... Once I learned about a lot of things and it started, re you know, about toxicities, which we'll talk about. But once I started thinking about the portability, because I don't own a home, I rent, and I've had to move a bunch of times, and I actually lost. I've wanted to keep my my aquaponic stuff to build, you know, to, to use as raised beds, and I had to give stuff away. I couldn't even, I couldn't sell it. I barely was able to give it away, and that really angered me. And that's why I chose to do container gardening. But it was also was the portability issues as well. So. Uh, as I said, you can't leave then uh, more than a few days. Uh, your aquaponic system, your fish, they'll last for probably about a good four or five days or so without any food. They're not going to be happy. But if you want to take a week-long vacation, unless you have somebody there, uh, and depending on the system that you use, there's those bell siphon uh, floats, right? Basically what it is is a, it's a pipe that's cut in these different ways to allow oxygen in bubbles Oh, it's a filter, uh, uh, a fill and drain system. So it fills up, and this bell siphon will come up and it'll burp, right? It'll go pop. There's air inside of it that will cause a fl uh, everything to to flow down. It's kind of complicated to explain in words, but basically it's like a you can imagine like a float on a toilet. Once it gets to a certain level, it drains the water out, right? Because the roots are going to need oxygen as well, um, depending on what I guess in, in what system you're doing. If you're doing it in gravel, we want to keep the flow of of uh, oxygen, right? We want oxygen to hit the roots and then flow back up. It just continue all, all day, right? We have oxygen in the water, uh, but unless you have a lot and doing different systems like floating, you know, raft or NFT systems, which I think I've got in here. Uh, maybe I should, well, I don't know. That's a lot. But since I've the cat's out of the bag, NFT nutrient film technique is basically, you guys have probably seen the, the uh, PVC pipe with the holes drilled in it. 
So the water continuously flows. I think some of them have on a timer where it flows and then it stops, gives it kind of a break. You know, your plants could sit there in the oxygen, no problem for a little while. They can't dry out. So what will happen is that pump will go off on a timer, set off the uh, the water to fill up the, these, these pipe systems that go into a rack, like a, a ladder. Uh, how can I explain it? Like a maze where it drains in from one end and then pours out the other. So it becomes, it gets flow. Now the floating raft system is basically styrofoam. Uh, with holes cut in it where you put little neck cups or plastic cups and all your plants float on top of this raft, right? And those are the kind of systems that never drain. They just continue uh, flowing the water in. But yeah, you can have problems. I guess what I want to say is if if that bell siphon was to kink a little bit and get knocked over, little uh, roots would find their way on the bottom, right? What happened to my system is the roots came in, such thing as uh, uh, watercress and, and peppermint. It comes in and obstructs that little bell siphon. It's just, it's just this little floating cup, basically, upside down. Once the roots got on the top where it couldn't lock in, what happened is it kept filling up and overflowing. And as the water's pumping from my fish tank, guess what's happening? All the water's draining off my, my aquaponic system, lower, lower, and lower, and lower. Gone for a week, you have dead fish, dead plants, everything. <coughs> if the electricity goes out, you're screwed, right? There's so many things that we can see that's bad. You, you're basically married to the thing. Whereas with, with uh, a system that's automated with, with a simple little water timer, you can set up all your, your, um, your containers, Right? And they got nutrients in them. You don't really have to worry about a pH. It's not going to fluctuate too bad. There's nothing really that you have to worry about except for maybe bugs, flying insects such as aphids, white fly, and stuff like that. Um, but you can set these systems up. And with the automated water, you can literally walk away for like two weeks. Right, and Depending on what time of year, if you timed it uh, where before the aphids actually get there or the white fly, right? there's certain temperatures I've noticed, tomato hornworm and things like that. You can leave for two weeks. By the time you get back, you can probably address this, the, most likely address the situation unless it's a complete infestation, right? Um, and there you go. And let's just say you had to hire somebody or ask somebody, could you keep an eye on my system while I'm gone? Now, to go and train someone how to check nitrites, ammonia, and what to do to lower them and, and raise them, how to fix a bell siphon if it's crooked, if it's not working, these are all serious things that uh, you'd have to really sit down and train somebody. Whereas... With the biodegradable container gardening or container gardening, you can literally do some things like, uh, let's say, neem oil, right? Neem oil uh, does help fight against powdery mildew. It will kill aphids and uh, on contact uh, white fly and stuff like that. So you can literally get a little pump, get it a, a, a little fogging pump, right? Just fill up a five gallon, depending on your system, fill up a, a gallon or five gallon of this stuff and just tell somebody, look, could you just come in every... Uh, uh, weekend, right? Every Saturday, it'd take you like 20 minutes. Just pump this thing up and just spray, just mist my entire garden, just but lightly mist it, right? And uh, that will help you to come back to a garden where you really don't have a problem. But I don't think that's even really necessary because I've left my, I go to my garden once every Friday, right, guys? Once a week. So I guess this is how I can say I like container gardening better than aquaponics is um, on my way home from work every day, I pick up my, uh, my kids. And every Friday is the day that I go check on my garden when I'm really busy. I literally go there for maybe about 20, 30 minutes. That's it. I'll do some videoing on it and, you know, some making some, some uh, social media stuff going on in my garden, some filming myself, explaining is what I'm doing. But literally, it, it takes me about 30 minutes every weekend to really weed, check the water system, make sure nothing's leaking. And I really don't see any problems happening at all. You can secure this thing before you leave on vacation, which, you know, guys, if you leave for a week, that just sucks. To me, the minimum should be 10 to 12 days. 12 days, ideally, takes you that, that a week just to decompress, right? And I don't want to be worrying about my food while I'm gone. I'd like to have something a lot more simpler. But yeah, when I think about it, the, the bio, my, my garden system, it's, it's maybe, what, two hours a month, really, once everything's planted? I'm talking just like the maintenance of the whole thing. Two hours a month to produce, uh, and at scale, I guess I should explain, uh, just in, in my greenhouse is like 360 plants, I believe, plus I've got another 40, 50, I'm probably a good 400 plants right now of growing stuff, and it takes me 30 minutes a, a week. So, okay, um, toxicity in the plastic styrofoam PVC that's what really got me out, and I pissed off a uh, the aquaponics community, a Facebook group, I think it was, a forum or something. I just got on there, and so what I did, guys, is um, I went and took 
samples of the water. Uh, and I had it tested and by a laboratory, and they said that this water is it's got a lot of toxins in it. I couldn't explain the the uh, understand the graphs very uh, much, you know, because they were kind of complicated. But in the words they said is, you might want to cons reconsider growing food in this type of water. And why is that? It's because of the sun beating on the uh, the styrofoam, right? So what a lot of people do. Um, I'll kind of take you guys through and, and see if this makes sense. The styrofoam, what, what they're doing is they're putting on a, they're taking it and they're drilling these little cylinders, like two inch holes, to three inch holes. And basically what you do is take the styrofoam and then you paint on house paint, some primer, right? You need something to stick to it. And then you're just going to get regular old house paint exterior, uh, gloss, I think is high gloss would be the best, you know, especially if it's going to be floating in water, that's got the most strength to it. And you coat this thing with two, three coats around uh, the top. And this is to protect the, the styrofoam from decomposing. Let's not even mention how many billions of years or whatever they say it, it takes for that styrofoam to decompose, right? And uh, you're doing huge amounts. This is the floating raft system I'm talking about, right? Uh, so not very sustainable, not even very resilient. As you start moving these things around, very convenient, right? Or convenience is what's killing us, I like to say on the show. Well, you can lift up, though, a two-by-four-foot piece with all this lettuce in it, and you can just set it on a table and work on stuff, replant it, and set it back in the water, and you're done, right? But by removing these things and chipping the corners, I've observed, which nobody talks about on these, you bump it, you, a little corner cracks, another little part cracks, and then slowly it starts to crumble and kind of fall apart. Eventually, you are going to have to re, uh, uh, replace it, right? But the biggest thing that I get... Uh, is the oxidization. If you guys don't understand what oxidization is, go to an old house that's been painted and take your finger and just rub it against the exterior of the, of the, of the wall or something, or the facial board or something. What you're going to notice is this powdery substance on your hand, right? What's happening is the sun is eating that, that coating away. It's, it's degrading it. Now, where is this coating going when it's sitting inside water where you're growing your fish and your food? It's circulating. Remember we talked about the dissolved oxygen? We basically have these chemicals dissolving into our water, being circulated over and over and over again, gassing off, right, plastics, and creating this toxic environment. And it has to sit in full sun all day, 24-7. It didn't make sense. So to go back to uh, the aquaponics, I, you know, I gave them these water samples, and it really flushed a bunch of people up. You know, I'm the irritating person asking questions that, you know, few people ask. And some people were on board, like, yeah, so... I said I'd like to do samples of, of my aquaponic system and other, you know, more uh, extensively, but it cost me 150 bucks of people willing to just, you know, everybody wants something for free. They're like, why don't you just show us, man? Why don't you just show us what you got? So I did, and that wasn't enough. I said, I want to do further stuff. And they're like, well, do it and let us know what the, what the results are. I'm like, can we all pull together and maybe go check out and see what's going on with our systems, right? Let's do a more extensive and uh, that wouldn't happen. In fact, then people started calling me names and they actually booted me out of there. For this simple question, I know I made a stain, right, on the underwear of, of the world in that, that area where it's a simple question, and I know it's irritating, but at the end of the day, I just want to know if I'm eating healthy, good foods, right? And we couldn't do it. So, yeah, if you look at one of the studies I've done, that's why, uh, for those of you watching, you guys heard me coughing, I'm drinking water from a glass mason jar. Uh, there's a stainless steel um, straw, and then there's also a... a Chipped my broke my tooth. I was driving, taking a drink, and hit my tooth on it. Cracked it right on the corner. I wasn't happy, so I got me this silicone, um, which actually goes perfect in what I want to talk about here. A little silicone strip here, which is um, is non toxic, right? It's got NSF approval. Um, when you put it on roofing systems, silicone coatings, it doesn't degrade. That's why they use it for cooking, right? This little nipple thing, which I'll wet my whistle. Uh, I do have, those of you probably saw, the plastic lid, right? BPA-free at least, though, right? Uh, but yeah, what I did as a study with plastics, uh, and I'll come back to the silicone, was that if you leave a plastic bottle uh, and you just barely do a scratch in it, this is all science if you need science for it. Look at, you know, sports bottles that bikers, you know, ten you know the, the, the people ride bikes, 10 speeds, I guess they call them. I don't know if they call them something different. I'm an old man. But uh, people go to the gym, right? Any little heat... A little scratch, anything if you're scrubbing it with a brush releases gases and it continues to release until the thing degrades. And a lot of people are saying this is, you know, contributing to bad poor, uh, health, right? And really, all you have to do is take like this glass jar 
fill it up with water and leave it in your car on a hot sunny day and then get yourself a plastic water container dump the water out and put the exact same water inside that side by side let them sit there all day and then take a drink smell it and you tell me what the difference is all right I, I looked at that I'm trying to get away from uh, uh, these toxins and stuff and just in the and biodegradable right I don't want to produce my own food I want to live a lifestyle where I'm leaving just a huge have you guys ever seen when people take their their garbage like how much garbage people actually use some people I think it was um, uh, Rob Greenfield actually wore every piece of article the garbage that he produced on his body in this big garbage suit and did a TED talks I think on it but it's amazing when you look at how much pills people eat how much because of most likely unhealthy foods that they're eating but how much plastic cups and things that it just you'll fill your whole entire house and in the end of your lifetime it's going to take forever especially how much styrofoam you're using so yeah uh get back to uh silicone now uh versus thermal plastics liners um what we have is oxidization again on the thermal it's called tpo and the place where i learned how to build commercial large scales a coyote in my driveway pretty cool uh, I wish I could show you guys that. Well, maybe I will. Let's see. Let's do something different here. I'm going to flip this camera around if I can. Oh, my windshield is raining. Oh, you can't see it. Never mind, guys. It's all rainy over there. Oh, that was cool. That was a huge coyote in my yard. Um... Anyways, getting back to the, the thermoplastics, yeah, it's called TPO. There's PVC roofs as well. Uh, PVC is, is the way they told me you can tell because it kind of looks like thermoplastics, right? So, guys, if you're using PVC in your, in your, your aquaponics, please stop, right? So, uh, PVC, you can tell thermoplastics. They're two different things. Just give it, clean it, and rub it, and then smell it, and you'll smell chlorine coming out of it. Whereas the other one, thermoplastics, you won't smell anything coming out of it. That's how you can tell. Years and years of abuse on a roof and you can still smell chlorine. The chlorine, I don't know, the chemical makeup of the stuff is what helps it to be so resilient, I guess. So thermoplastics, though, is same thing. Uh, you can look at any coatings that are exposed to dead sun, like a south-facing wall, uh, depending on where you're at in the world. You know, A wall that's ex exposed to the sun, that's coated. You can pretty much figure in... Uh, well, I guess roofs get beat up a lot, so I don't know if it'll equate the same on walls. But on a roof, at least, you can imagine two sheets of paper, just regular old fax, you know, fax paper, <laughs> printing paper, I guess. Nobody uses faxes anymore. But get yourself a layer of paper, and each paper, I believe, is a mill, one mill. Two sheets of paper every year. That's how much is oxidizing off your roof. Now, as we place these things into as a pond liner, where's that dust and where's that oxidization going? It's going into your food. I think, dude, do you, a lot of you guys know um, some of these infections? So what was it? The what do they call it? E. coli? It was in, uh, I think it was in melons. And then the, the first one I remember ever seeing blew my mind was like 10 years ago was in, um, I think Chipotle or something got in trouble. Um, but it was in uh, romaine lettuce. And what happened, they say, is that some of the workers didn't have a bathroom. So they were going poo-poo, right? They were going poo-poo uphill, like in the bushes. And uh, there's that coyote distracting me again. And the rain would come down to wash this human fecal matter in. And, and what happened with the E. coli? Why was there E. coli inside of the vegetables? Well, when a root system goes down, it absorbs, right? That's what I'm talking about, this oxidization, this powder stuff in the water. Or let's just say the ammonia, right? The excretion from the fish. Everything's being sucked in, nutrients, toxins, and everything. It goes into the cardiovascular system of the plant. So if there's some sort of toxin or some, something worse like, like human feces, um, it's going to suck it in and hold it inside of itself. And then we eat it and we get sick, right? So think about that. That's a perfect analogy. One of the things I found too, I just kind of want to throw off here is that I think it was Bill Nye, the science guy of all people, uh, might've been him or somebody else. They were showing that sunblock people who apply sunblock at the beach while they go in the water and then they go home and shower off right there at the beach, you know, we're just bathing in the water with the sunblock in the ocean, something so massive. There's these little fish that the chemicals from the uh, sunblock was actually changing its gender to all males. And there was no more females. And this fish was dying off because there was no more females. And they figured out there was this toxin in there, the same toxin that there's in their bodies that there is in sunblock. So we look at the currents and the movement of the ocean and just the amount of this, these chemicals from sunblock affects nature just on that bit. I thought I'd throw that out there. Okay, so we know what the problem is. What is the solution? 
if you were going to do aquaponics, which I kind of look at um, me, I don't, I don't think I'm ever going to do it again, unless I was like, there was just sand, right? And I mean, I needed to start eating now. I would still implement container gardening and wood mulch if I had my access. But I had, if I had nothing, none of this, which I would never want to put, put myself in that position, I would definitely go aquaponics. It's better than nothing, right? But silicone, as I say, they use for body, like breasts and I can't believe butt implants. Who gets butt implants? I probably should. Mine looks like a two by four. It's just, it's gone. My butt has migrated into my belly now. I'm like, I got this dad bod thing going on. But anyways, um, yeah, the silicone, it doesn't really oxidize. And one of the applications that I'm going to use it for is that uh, I want to create my own seedlings to sell, right? So I wouldn't even need this if I wasn't selling seedlings. I, what I want to do is create a seedling business to offset the cost of my home. I've talked about this before where um, it's relevant, I guess, because you guys would need to know why, why would you, well, what's some applications of the silicone? Mine is to make my place cash flow. Now I don't own the place, so I can't rent, I can't build a rental or anything like that. But if I do on scale and I'm able <clears throat> to sell um, seedlings, let's just say, uh, and, and I think it's little eight ounce cups. I just went to Home Depot and Lowe's guys and looked at it. It's $6 for a, <laughs> it's $6 for a piece of lettuce. There's one lettuce growing, this romaine lettuce. They want to sell it for $6. I can go buy three heads at the store for $6, right? Well, I don't know about now. The prices of food's just going, everything's going crazy. But for a seedling, it's $6. Let's just say I, um, I grew my own, grew like a couple extra thousand and sold them for half the price. Let's just say I sold them for $3 a piece. I think originally I was doing them at, it was $5 uh, last year in December, I believe. They went up a whole dollar, I think, in 30 days out here in Sunnyside, California. But if I sold mine for half the price and I created a thousand seedlings, right? That's a thousand dollars per uh, per tray, per silicone tray that I would do. If I did this a couple times, uh, let's just say 12 times to make things even, that's $12,000 a year. If I did this through spring, summer, and fall, this is offsetting the cost of my rent, right? This is, I just, I just want to explain this money thing because I, it's relevant to being, to producing your own food and use of aqua, of, of, well, not aquaponics, but liners and stuff like that. So literally if my rent is $3,000 a month, it just went down to two. This place is cash flowing. Now we're not going to go into, I should probably do a whole separate video of the food I'm producing for myself. That I don't have to buy at the grocery store. So it's serving a purpose. It's not just a place, an aquarium where I come and sleep, right? So the, the getting back to the silicone, this is where I would build a plywood box, let's just say uh, eight by four, and I would put about six inch walls on it. And what I would literally do is apply a primer uh, on there, on the, between the uh, wood and the, and the silicone, let that dry off, and then I would literally paint a silicone, several coats of sil silicone coating and reinforce the corners and everything for, moving, for movement. Drill myself a little hole, place a little PVC pipe with a small little, maybe quarter inch hole at the bottom, right? That sandwich it with a gasket. So there's a big hole on top and a little hole on the bottom. And what happened is I take all these seedlings and I could put them in little pots, place them inside this little vat of silicone, which is non-toxic now, right? It's got NSF approval. You can drink the water off the roof. You know, you can pretty sure you can drink it on the, in, out of this container or my plants aren't going to have some sort of plastic, you know, sickness inside them. So what happened, even if I wanted to leave, I could put a float valve and every time the water gets low, or I could put a water timer on, I could fill up this container about one inch of water and saturate my seedlings. And slowly that water will drip out of that quarter inch hole. And on the top area, if it ever overflows, the water goes into the large one inch hole. So I never have to worry about it overflowing. Um, these, the, the problem with silicone is that it's very uh, delicate. So you don't want to scratch it, right? You'd have to repair it if you started moving stuff around. Uh, uh, too bad. That's where the thermoplastics and the PVC is a lot more durable, right? Now we're getting to something like silicone. It's a little more softer. I don't know if you guys have ever touched silicone caulking or something. You can see it's kind of, it's like rubbery, right? Um, so one of the things I came up with was biodegradable bags. They've got these little bags you could buy, these little white cloth, and they're, it's just basically sliding cloth around. So if I filled this whole thing up and put these seedlings in there, I think we'd be relatively fine. So those are applications I wanted to say with the silicone that in contrast to thermoplastics and PVC and just aquaponics in general. So to bring it all home, bring it all together, what the heck am I talking about here? I'm talking about food shortages, people, and that we need to start growing our own food. And I think the next show I'm gonna do is just about that. What am I growing? I'd love to hear what you guys want, want to hear, what type of things, but it's time to get food production going. 
And I think a lot of us don't ask certain questions about how our food is done, right? To look at the whole systems and say, is there a better way? Is this good? Is this good for me? Is this good for the planet, right? We haven't even talked about hydroponics where you got to dump a bunch of synthetic nutrients in there. And then once the water gets too salted, you got to drain the whole thing into God knows where and then refill it and start it again, right? Is that sustainable? Is that, is that sustainable in a food shortage system, right? Where we have to depend on buying these, where are these synthetic things going to come from? So to sum it all up, <coughs> um, I'm, I'm definitely looking at uh, doing the container gardening uh, even better than in-ground gardening, guys. You, you, you basically are, are developing soil for somebody else, right? You're on a spin farm property or the house you're renting. You can't take that with you. With me, my garden systems that I've built, the soil I've built, rather, goes with me wherever. I have the richest soil in, in the world. I do not own the land, but I own the best, I own better soil than where most people have land. And I get to take it with, wherever with me. Anything can change. It goes with me. I never stops. It's an investment that I look at. Everybody can make now, which is literally for free. You can go in. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what type of soils and stuff to do for these things, whether you can just, you know, build your own soil with compost and stuff like that. And then uh, just fill instead of putting uh, 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 anything like vermiculites and uh, things like that, peat mosses and stuff. If you can just do it. I know they're doing it in other like Thailand and stuff like that. So that takes a little bit more experimentation. But to, yeah, to bring it all home, you're repairing the earth. You're producing food instantane, like quickly too, guys. Um, you can do microgreens in, these, in, in a container gardening where I'm not sure if you can really, you could probably do with some ideas, you know, in shallow gravel systems and aquaponics. But, you know, it just seems to bring it home just a lot more reliable than aquaponic systems. And, you know, I think certain applications in aquaponic system would be good, but in, in almost all of them, I think you're better off just growing stuff out of a container. It's simpler. We're repairing the earth as we go, leaving it better than the way we found it. And it opens up so much more potential. It's a lot less complicated than aquaponics. Just go into container gardening. So without babbling off, that's the show. Again, there's, you know, in the description below, there's stuff if you guys want to hear. But I'm, I'm freaked out about this, this food supply system. And not just the food supply. It's how we're eating our food. Learning about how there's uranium in the soil and all these kind of things. You guys might want to really consider, you know, people are pooping where they're harvesting food. Do you want that? right? We're dependent on all from toxicity to even if we can even get the toxic food. So yeah, that's the soapbox. That's the show today, guys. I hope it finds you well. Uh, I got to get to work on this rainy day and I'll catch you guys on the other one. As always, thank you guys so much for watching your input reviews and that li like button will definitely help to get this show off the ground, man. If you guys could really help me out that I, I rarely ask for it. I guess I should a lot more, but uh, guys, that's the show. Oh, thank you so much. And we will be back again for another one.